Welcome to our webinar, Hearing Care for All, Screen, Rehabilitate, Communicate. Today, March 3rd, it is World Hearing Day. In Centogene, we are raising awareness about hearing loss with this event. In today's webinar, we have with us Brittany Cryer, medical liaison at Centogene, assisting the U.S. health team and supporting our West Coast accounts. Brittany received her bachelor's degree in biology from Converse College and a master's degree in genetic counseling from the University of Oklahoma. Throughout the webinar, Brittany will provide an overview about hearing loss and our available genetic tests for a screening, the center here panel. At the end of the webinar, she will share different clinical case studies and lessons learned. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A chat and we will refer back to them at the end of the presentation. Welcome, Brittany, and many thanks for joining today's webinar. The floor is yours. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's my pleasure to be speaking to all of you on World Hearing Day. And the topic of hearing loss and genetics is very important to acknowledge because of the current research and emerging therapies that are based on specific genetic findings. So today, we are going to review hearing loss and genetics, review the Centogene Next Generation Sequencing Panel called CentoHear, and then also some important clinical case review as well. So to start things off, we will be reviewing genetics and hearing loss. Hearing loss overall is most likely more common than you expect. So some of these statistics here speak to that point. Two out of every 3,000 babies are born with some degree of hearing loss, and more than 90% of those children with hearing loss have typical hearing parents. So again, speaks to the possibility of recessive component for inheritance there. One in five Americans that are 12 and over have hearing loss, while one in eight of those have hearing loss in both ears and one third of individuals ages 65 to 74 have a hearing loss. So again, something that affects a lot of our population. Overall, the definition of hearing loss is the ability or inability to um, hear sounds either totally or partially in one or both ears. A hearing deficit is defined as either in one or both ears in threshold greater than 20 decibels and a disabling hearing loss for adults would be greater than 40 decibels and in children greater than 30 decibels. So as outlined here on the right, there's different severities of hearing loss depending on how many decibels they cannot hear. So overall, knowing the degree of hearing loss is very important to the management of that particular individual. And determining the severity of the hearing loss is done by an audiogram. So those are the outcome of a hearing evaluation, such as what you see on the right. It's a map or, you know, sort of a graph as pictured here. So hearing tests are not typically given in a percentage. The degree of hearing loss is based on recorded audiometric thresholds that range in severity from mild to profound. Loudness of sound is measured in decibels. So again, with a mild hearing loss, which is 20 to 40 decibels, um, an individual would have difficulty hearing soft speech um, and listening in background noise. So a mild hearing loss might be manageable for an adult, but in children is important because it could impact their language development. And for a moderate hearing loss, which would be 41 to 55 decibels, there would be difficulty in hearing general conversation, especially in background noise. Speech would have to be loud to be understood. The TV or radio would often need to be turned up to a very high volume to be heard clearly. And for children, their comprehension without any sort of intervention would be affected. So anything greater or more severe than moderate, there would be some sort of effect on comprehension without any sort of intervention. And as far as sounds, so sounds occur in different intensities and pitches. So for example, a firecracker is heard at about 500 Hertz as far as intensity. And then when we refer to the loudness, 
it's 120 decibels. So a firecracker is low pitch, but high intensity. Whereas birds chirping, those are at a high pitch. So that occurs at about 6,000 Hertz, but 10 decibels. So it's high pitch, low intensity. Conversational speech spans the audiogram in sort of a banana shape that ranges from 250 Hertz to greater than 8,000 Hertz and ranges in intensity from 20 to 60 decibels depending on the syllable. And it's important to identify the individuals that have hearing loss that falls into this banana because those are the individuals that are most likely to need intervention to be able to communicate and respond appropriately. Our brains need to hear sound to learn and make connections to the environment. So a child that can hear the sounds of speech will have a much easier time imitating and understanding learning spoken language when compared to a child who cannot hear sounds at all. So further characterizing hearing loss, there are several different types. Conductive hearing loss results from abnormalities of the external ear or, and or the ossicles of the middle ear. It can often be corrected with medical or surgical intervention, examples being ear infections, impacted earwax, allergies, or a benign tumor. Sensory neural hearing loss results from the malfunction of the inner ear structures and usually cannot be medically or surgically corrected. There are interventions that can be um, provided to aid that person, but there is no official cure to make that go away. Mixed hearing loss is a combination of conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. This could include damage to the outer or middle ear as well as the cochlea or auditory nerve. Central auditory dysfunction results from damage or dysfunction at the level of the eighth cranial nerve, auditory stem, or cerebral cortex. And any of these types of hearing loss can occur at two different onsets. So prelingual means the individual has not yet developed speech. So this would be um, like congenital hearing loss, whereas postlingual would occur after the development of normal speech. So there are many different causes of hearing loss. Environmental or acquired hearing loss can commonly result from infections, typically labeled TORCH or toxoplasmosis, rubella, cytomegalovirus and herpes, or also postnatal infections such as bacterial meningitis. In developed countries, the most common environmental cause or you know, non-genetic cause of hearing loss would be congenital CMV infection. Genetic hearing loss can have mixed types. It can be sensory neural, a combination under mixed or conductive. And traumatic hearing loss would be when there is an insult or injury to the ear or anatomy of the ear or related to, you know, continuous exposure to very loud environments um, that would eventually cause hearing loss. When we talk about the types of hearing loss that are hereditary, 80% of prelingual, so pre-normal speech development hearing loss has a genetic component. Of the cases that have a genetic component, they're divided into syndromic and non-syndromic categories. Syndromic would mean that the individual has hearing loss, but could have a number of other health concerns across multiple body systems. Non-syndromic refers to that the patient only has hearing loss and that there are no other body systems affected. Within the non-syndromic category, there are several different inheritance patterns, so ways that this could be passed on. The majority of those are recessive, as we sort of discussed earlier, that a lot of babies with hearing loss are typically born to normal hearing parents. And then there's another almost 20% that are dominantly inherited with a small percentage that could be mitochondrial or X-linked. So sort of further breaking down non-syndromic hearing loss, again, several different types of inheritance. They are extremely heterogeneous from a gene standpoint. And so overall, the best strategy for your patients is a multi-gene sequencing panel that's going to give you the highest diagnostic rate. So the diagram on the right outlines an individual with hearing loss should have an overall physical exam and audiometric testing. 
if that patient is then to determine to have a non-syndromic sensory neural hearing loss, the best next step is to have a large genetic testing panel. If that panel was negative, you could alternatively consider temporal bone imaging and further genetics evaluation for that patient to determine other causes. If the gene panel was positive, you would then be able to determine, is this gene related to a syndromic form of hearing loss or non-syndromic? So if syndromic form, you would then try to identify if there are any other appropriate referrals or tests that should be performed. If the patient ultimately has a non-syndromic form of hearing loss, you know, continuing with their routine management and always potentially following up with genetics for future family planning and making sure that the family understands the results and is connected with appropriate specialists. So again, just further delving into non-syndromic hearing loss for dominant conditions, um, there are more than 25 genes identified. The audiologic profile can be distinct with these genes. So it is sometimes helpful that can be correlated back to genotype phenotype correlations. And dominant genes are most likely to cause postlingual non-syndromic hearing loss. So again, hearing loss that occurs after the development of normal speech. As discussed previously, the majority of the cases fall into the recessive category with up to 50% of people who have severe and profound hearing loss carrying GJB2 or Connexin 26 pathogenic variants. So that's the most common recessive cause of hearing loss. And then with the small less than 1% that make up mitochondrial and X-linked, those are attributed to mtRNR1 and mtTS1. And there are five possible X-linked genes that could cause pre or post lingual hearing loss. Now sort of switching to the hearing loss that is caused or a part of a larger genetic syndrome, there are over 400 genetic syndromes that have been described to include hearing loss. And of course, because there are so many, there are many different inheritance patterns that are associated with each particular syndrome. And overall, syndromic hearing loss includes up to 30% of prelingual deafness. So important to evaluate this in your patients. One of the common causes for syndromic hearing loss is Wardenberg syndrome. This is a group of disorders that can cause hearing loss and pigmentation changes. Um, those pigmentation changes are within the skin, hair, and the eyes. Wurnberg specifically has four different types that are extremely variable, and it is the most common dominant cause of sensory neural hearing loss. So some of the common features of Wardenberg syndrome are a white forelock or you know, patch of hair sort of at the, the front of the forehead, early or premature graying, heterochromia, which is uh, different colored eyes or very bright blue eyes, sensory neural hearing loss, obviously a part of that. So type one, Warnberg syndrome is caused by mutations in the PAX3 gene, and it includes the characteristic features of Warnberg syndrome, plus individuals typically have more widely spaced eyes. Type two is associated with mutations in the MITF and SNAI two gene, and hearing loss is actually most common in people with type two. Type three is caused by mutations, again, in the PAX3 gene, and three involves the characteristic features of the condition, along with potential bilateral malformations of the limbs, hands, and arms. And then four can be attributed to EDN3, EDNRB, and SOX10 genes. And again, sort of these very diagnostic features, but along with Hirschsprung's disease. So overall for your patients, as we discussed, the large gene panel is going to be your first choice. Centogene offers um, such a panel through our next gen sequencing panels called CentoHere. Our mission at Centogene is to provide precise diagnoses of inherited disorders at the earliest time possible. This way we can affect the most change and transform medical expertise and analytical information, transforming that into an actionable result for patients, providers, and our pharmaceutical partners. So overall at Centagene, we provide 
an optimized workflow and process to try to give the highest quality results in the shortest amount of time. So we have quality from our customer relations standpoint and communication before the test is ordered to help make sure that everything happens quickly and right away. And then as far as sample collection, we can arrange logistics to help you out. Then once the test is running, we offer quality you know, data management to help interpret those results and, and process the sample. And then ultimately for our reporting through our CentOMD, which is our internal database, we can provide high quality medical interpretation and reporting for your patients. Overall, for our next-gen sequencing panels, those are gonna include all coding regions, plus or minus 10 base pairs of the exon intron boundaries, and they're gonna include all relevant deep intronic and regulatory mutations that have been described not only in our internal database, CentOMD, but also in HGMD. It's gonna include single nucleotide variants, insertion deletions, and copy number variants. And then also auxiliary assays. The typical turnaround time for all of our panels, including CENTO here is 25 business days. Just some further breakdown about this panel. There are 196 genes included in the panel, which at least in the US market is one of the higher number of genes that are available from one single test. We do use Illumina technology. So over 99.5% of the bases covered at greater than 20X. This is gonna include syndromic and non-syndromic genes. And again, the turnaround time of 25 days, you can request fast processing, which would decrease the turnaround time to 15 days for a small extra fee. And currently raw data and research reports are not available for any of our panels. It's convenient that you can provide in the US market a buckle swab, but our preferred material for all testing at Centogene is our Cento card, which is a dried blood spot card. You can send us DNA or whole blood as well. And you can find all of those specimen requirements on Centogene.com. So just in review, the Cento here panel is an excellent choice because it's going to include syndromic and non-syndromic genes. So some of the disorders that are included are Alport syndrome, Pendred syndrome, Usher, Wurnberg, brachio-otorenal, and many more. And then for the linked non-syndromic genes, they're going to be those across all inheritance patterns other than the mitochondrial genes. Overall at Centogene, we want to make a difference with the patient in mind. So we have over 12 years of innovation and leadership in understanding rare diseases. We've helped more than 100,000 families each year. We feel like we have a robust menu to be able to offer to your patients in hopes to provide more information and ultimately change their treatment. We are a globally diverse company accepting samples in more than 100 countries worldwide. And with our lab certifications, we're able to offer the highest quality possible. So now we're going to review a few cases from our CENTO here panel that can be helpful in patient management. So the first case is a seven-year-old female who had post-lingual sensory neural hearing loss with no other health concerns. Her brother also was reported to have similar findings and the physician suspected Pendred syndrome. The siblings come from a non-consanguineous family and parents are unaffected. Through CentoHear testing, we were able to identify three different variants in the USH2A gene for the proban and her brother. There was one pathogenic variant, one likely pathogenic variant, and a variant of uncertain significance. Overall, these patients were consistent with Usher syndrome type 2A, which is a recessively inherited disorder comprised of the presence of bilateral sensory neural hearing loss with a particular eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa. So because there was the presence of three different variants, it was important for us to determine you know, what is the orientation of these variants, which ones are truly affecting these particular siblings. So parental testing was performed. The unaffected father carried the pathogenic variant and the variant of uncertain significance in cysts, meaning that they were on the same allele. 
whereas the mother carried the likely pathogenic variant. So for the children in trans, meaning on separate chromosomes, the C.15297 mutation and the C.2299 deletion were the ultimate cause for their diagnosis. So just a little bit of a review about Usher syndrome. It is the most common recessive form of sensory neural hearing loss, and it can affect hearing and vision, as I stated through retinitis pigmentosa. Types one and two are the most common. Type one, the hearing loss is present at birth and the visual impairment occurs in childhood. Whereas in type two, there is severe hearing loss with degeneration of the retina. And then in type three, there is hearing loss as well with late onset of degeneration of the retina. So specifically for type one and two, so 40% of all cases of Usher are actually type one. There are six different genes that can cause type one Usher syndrome. So it's ultimately recessive with diagenic inheritance and the overall management would be cochlear implants with vestibular rehabilitation. In type two, there's the mild to moderate congenital hearing loss with possibly intact or variable vestibular responses plus the retinitis pigmentosa. There are three different genes that can cause type two with recessive inheritance again and similar management. Overall, these are important to point out because there are current and emerging therapies that are under investigation for both type one and two. USHSTAT is a phase one, phase two clinical trial that's currently available for USHER type one. This trial is to evaluate the safety and activity for retinal gene therapy to treat the retinitis pigmentosa for individuals who have MYO7A mutations. The trial is active, but not currently recruiting. All the other listed therapies are associated with type two. So the QR421 is another phase one or two clinical trial that is to evaluate the safety of um, an antisense og oligonucleotide therapy to treat retinitis pigmentosa in individuals who have specific H2A pathogenic variants. C1804 and CL1701 are additional clinical trials that are evaluating specific antioxidant treatments for patients with retinitis pigmentosa. And then the supplements, including vitamin A, those have all been somewhat studied, but, and play a role in different areas of, you know, eye development and function, but are not necessarily you know, current treatments, but can be helpful at times. For our second case, this was a 36 year old female with a history of severe hearing impairment. She had a negative family history for hearing loss and her parents were related to be um, first cousins. Through her CentoHear testing, we were able to identify a homozygous likely pathogenic mutation in the CDH23 gene. This is consistent with autosomal recessive deafness type 12, which includes a profound prelingual sensory neural hearing loss with no other associated clinical findings. CDH23 also is associated with another type of Usher syndrome, type 1D, that has congenital profound hearing loss with vestibular dysfunction and retinitis pigmentosa. So because of this patient's age and the fact that for 36 years she had no other reported clinical symptoms, we were able to say that it is with high suspicion that she has the non-syndromic form of hearing loss. If she was a pediatric patient, it might've been a little bit more difficult to determine and a pediatric patient in this scenario would have potentially undergo additional evaluations to rule in or rule out the particular associated phenotype. For our final case, we had a five month old male with bilateral deafness, no other reported information, no family history provided and consanguinity was unknown. In this case, the center here panel provided us with a homozygous pathogenic variant in the OTOF gene. And this gene is associated with autosomal recessive deafness type nine. There are two specific phenotypes for OTOF, either prelingual non-syndromic hearing loss or a temperature sensitive non-syndromic auditory neuropathy. 
And in the first two years of life, OTOF deafness can appear to be auditory neuropathy based on the specific audiometric testing. But over time, certain features on the testing disappear that can be more consistent with a cochlear defect. And luckily for us, our internal CentOMD database had identified five other patients um, with this specific variant who had the hearing loss. So we were able to say that this patient fell under the non-syndromic hearing loss category because of our robust data. Parental testing was ultimately recommended to confirm homozygosity of the variant in order to rule out the possibility of compound heterozygosity for a larger deletion. So sort of putting all of this into practice and management of the patients, individuals with hearing loss should have routine management and surveillance from an otolaryngologist and audiologist that specialize in working with individuals with hearing loss. And then of course, if the individual has any other health concerns, they should be seeing appropriate specialists for that as well. And the potential for a clinical genetics evaluation and obviously for children to see their pediatrician. An important part of evaluation is determining the appropriate habilitation option. Possibilities can include hearing aids, vibrotactile devices, and cochlear implantation. And cochlear implantation can be considered in children older than one year of age with severe to profound hearing loss. The ultimate goal in evaluation and treatment for a child with hearing loss is mainstream schooling. So research shows that diagnosis by the age of three months with therapy and habilitation by six months can make this goal possible for children with mild to moderate hearing loss. Cochlear implantation in children with severe to profound deafness who are part of mainstream education lead to better overall social functioning and emotional or educational attachment and attainment um, that's indistinguishable those individuals with normal hearing. And recent research has focused on the cochlear implant performance based on the particular gene involved or causing the patient's hearing loss. So due to the overall heterogeneous nature of genetic causes, large sample sizes are difficult to obtain for performance on a per gene basis. However, Data is clear that individuals with Connexin 26 or GJB2 related hearing loss have excellent cochlear implant outcomes and are significantly better than those individuals with environmental causes of deafness. And all of this sort of hit home for me five years ago. I became the parent of a child with congenital bilateral hearing loss. My daughter, who's pictured on the right, was identified through newborn hearing screening, and she was able to receive her hearing aids by eight weeks of age, and, and then ultimately began a listening and spoken language program. I'm thankful for newborn screening, and that it gave my family the opportunity to address her hearing loss so quickly. And it has helped my daughter to achieve regular mainstream schooling and reach all of her developmental milestones on time. So in the US, newborn hearing screening is standard for all babies born. Babies are typically screened in the hospital, either in the nursery or in their mother's room. And the hearing screening is painless. Most babies are often asleep during the process. If a baby does not pass from their hospital evaluation, they should have a complete hearing test by an audiologist before three months of age. So typically there is a referral process that's generated by the state or by the pediatrician based on the failure of the newborn hearing screen. So studies show that outcomes are best if babies with hearing loss begin intervention before six months of age. Finding hearing loss early and enrollment into a therapy program for babies helps a child to communicate better with others, do well in school, and get along with other children. Overall, intervention can consist of working with a team who's trained in children with hearing loss and help the family learn to communicate with what works best for that severity of hearing loss, fit them with a hearing device, join support groups, and other resources. So overall, early detection of hearing loss 
enables patients to see the appropriate specialists and receive the intervention that they need sooner. And outcomes are improved with early treatment and intervention. So in summary, there is a high percentage of prelingual hearing loss that has a genetic cause due to the large number of possible genetic causes for hearing loss. A large multi-gene panel is the best first-tier diagnostic test. Large gene panels and whole exome sequencing can help to identify this broad differential diagnosis. And CENTO here is an excellent test choice based on the large number of genes included in our panel, the pricing of the panel, our 25-day turnaround time, and Centogene's superior medical reporting. Genetic testing for individuals with hearing loss will be increasingly important as new treatments and therapeutic options, such as the USHTAT gene therapy, become more readily available based on the specific gene or specific mutation. Thank you all for listening and we can start taking questions. Many thanks, Brittany, for this presentation. We already have some questions. The first one is, what are the specimen requirements for the CENTO here panel? So yes, thank you for the question. As far as the panel, again, in the US, you could send in a buccal swab, but overall our preferred sample, sample type at Centogene is the dried blood spot card, which is called the CENTO card. That can be done and shipped uh, no problem and maintained but we can accept whole blood and ready to use DNA. And again, all specimen requirements and information can be found on our website at centogene.com. Thanks. Another question is, if my patient has a negative CENTO here panel, would there be any further recommended test to help establish a diagnosis? So yes, the, the CENTO here panel may not identify all causes of hearing loss. It's a good first tier test. In the event of a negative CENTO here panel, we would recommend proceeding with a whole exome sequencing. And you could alternatively add on a mitochondrial genome with that to identify some of the maybe lesser common causes of hearing loss. Great. Many thanks, Brittany. From now on, we don't have any more questions. If you have some other question in the meantime, you can write us and we will be happy to answer you. Brittany, one more time, many thanks for sharing your insights and thanks all the participants for joining to this webinar. We are going to launch a poll now to receive your feedback. So please take a few minutes to fill it out. Thank you one more time and have a great day.